Buonasera a tutte e a tutti, un saluto anche a chi ci segue in diretta streaming. Benvenute e benvenuti a questa nuova Padua Freedom Lecture. Eh, le Padua Freedom Lecture sono, come sapete, il ciclo di eventi, di incontri ideato in occasione delle celebrazioni per gli 800 anni della nostra università, eh, su intorno, intorno al tema della Libertas. La Freedom Lecture di oggi è di la, la professoressa Mary Beard e ha per titolo, come vedete, sull'assenza di libertà, vivere e scrivere sotto un imperatore romano. Vi ricordiamo cortesemente di silenziare i vostri cellulari. E diamo inizio a questo incontro. Eh, chiamerei quindi subito sul podio la professoressa Monica Salvadori, prorettrice al patrimonio artistico, storico e culturale. Grazie. Buonasera a tutte e a tutti. È davvero un piacere oggi pomeriggio portare i saluti della magnifica rettrice professoressa Daniela Mappelli in occasione dell'incontro con la professoressa e scrittrice Mary Burr nell'ambito delle Padua Freedom Lecture, ideate come momenti di confronto con voci significative del panorama internazionale che si distinguono per l'espressione di diverse declinazioni dell'idea e dell'esercizio della libertà. Non posso che complimentarmi con le colleghe Annalisa Oboe e Margherita Losacco, promotrici dell'iniziativa, che dialogheranno con Mary Bird, una delle studiose dell'antichità classica più conosciute al mondo, la cui presenza qui a Padova, nell'anno delle celebrazioni degli 800 anni dell'Università, è per me motivo di grande soddisfazione. Sono certa che il pubblico potrà apprezzare dal vivo la sua brillante capacità di parlarci del mondo classico, della società greco-romana, nelle sue forme di rappresentazione e ricezione e in particolare, durante la chiacchierata odierna, del ruolo e del lavoro dell'intellettuale nel difficile rapporto con il potere della Roma imperiale. Dal mio personale punto di vista, in quanto archeologa dell'antichità classica, voglio solo ricordare che nel 2010 quando ci fu il crollo della cosiddetta caserma dei gladiatori di Pompei, allorché l'intera opinione pubblica puntò il dito contro la gestione nazionale di un sito che è sì italiano, ma che ha un valore universale, Mary Bird rappresentò una delle più interessanti voci fuori dal coro, come si evince dalla bella introduzione alla traduzione italiana del suo saggio dedicato a Pompei, vita quotidiana di una città dell'antica Roma, dove dichiarò la necessità di uno sforzo internazionale al fine della salvaguardia di un sito così straordinario. Una prospettiva attuata durante quest'ultimo decennio e della quale abbiamo cominciato a vedere i risultati. Sono quindi particolarmente lieta di dare il benvenuto a Padova, a Mary Bird, e auguro a tutto il pubblico un buon ascolto. Grazie professoressa e ora lasciamo la parola al professor Gianluigi Baldo, direttore del Dipartimento di Scienze Storiche, Geografiche e dell'Antichità. Prego. Prendo brevemente la parola anch'io per dare il più caloroso benvenuto alla professoressa Mary Bird, a nome del Dipartimento che dirigo, il Dipartimento di Scienze Storiche, Geografiche e dell'Antichità, ma anche degli altri colleghi antichisti della Scuola di Scienze Umane, Sociali e del Patrimonio Culturale. Siamo davvero felici di poterla oggi accogliere nella nostra Università, la cui storia secolare annovera studiosi illustri che hanno dato un contributo fondamentale alla filologia classica, alla storia antica e all'archeologia. Fra tutti mi piace qui ricordare il nome del latinista Concetto Marchesi, che fu rettore e partigiano a Padova in anni bui e che il 9 novembre del 1943, nel giorno in cui in quest'Aula si teneva l'inaugurazione dell'anno accademico, cacciò i militi fascisti saliti su questo podio. Da studioso e professore, Marchesi seppe farsi, sono parole sue, 
risoluto uomo d'azione per la difesa della libertà, nutrito dalla meditazione sugli autori antichi, quegli autori verso i quali sapeva trarre nelle sue lezioni appassionate folle di giovani, ben oltre il novero degli studenti di lettere, con una passione educativa esemplare. L'amore per la libertà e l'amore per gli studi classici che Marchesi seppe intrecciare con l'eccezionale testimonianza del suo percorso intellettuale e politico appaiono dunque uno dei doni più preziosi che l'Università di Padova vuole consegnare alle nuove generazioni di studiosi. L'incontro di oggi vede protagonista una studiosa che ha saputo coniugare la passione per l'antichità e il dialogo con la contemporaneità, rendendo l'una necessaria all'altra e facendo di questo legame un punto di vista originale per intervenire efficacemente e fecondamente nel dibattito pubblico. La sua presenza è un'occasione preziosa per meditare sul contributo decisivo che il mondo classico può offrire alle donne e agli uomini del nostro tempo. Per questo è importante ricordare quanto sia essenziale la formazione di specialisti del mondo classico, compito precipuo dell'Università. Come dice Mary Beard in un suo volume, Fare i conti sui classici, uscito in Italia nel 2017, è fondamentale che il dialogo con gli antichi sia fondato sulla competenza. Questo non significa, e cito l'autrice, che tutti, de- che tutti debbano imparare il latino e il greco, perché la comprensione culturale è un'operazione collaborativa, sociale. La forza globale dei classici non si misura in base al numero di giovani che hanno studiato il greco e il latino al liceo e all'università, ma su quanti ritengano necessaria la presenza nel nostro mondo di persone che conoscano il latino e il greco, su quanti ritengano che queste competenze siano importanti e meritevoli di essere pagate, di ricevere uno stipendio. La diffusione della conoscenza dei classici basata su competenze professionali è importante se vogliamo che del mondo antico venga diffusa un'immagine non mistificante, non retorica, non idealizzata, ma rispettosa della distanza che ci separa da esso e fondata sul sapere critico, come Merbeard ci ha insegnato a fare. Per tornare a Marchesi, alla sua vita spesa per la libertà e strettamente legata per la, e strettamente legate per la cultura e per la scuola, non è un caso che si debba a lui uno degli articoli, va ricordato come non sia un, un caso che si debba a lui uno degli articoli più belli della Costituzione italiana, quell'articolo 33 che recita l'arte e la scienza sono libere e libero ne è l'insegnamento. A lui, a Marchesi, si deve anche prob- probabilmente il motto che guida anche queste celebrazioni degli 800 anni dell'Università di Padova, Universa Universis Patavina Libertas. La Libertas, che il motto evoca e che l'Università abbraccia come idea guida, è la Libertas che Marchesi ha contribuito a riconquistare con la parola e con l'azione. Ma sotto la medesima parola, Libertas, possono nascondersi le sorprese e le insidie di significati ambigui, che è compito della filologia smascherare. Quanto ha a che fare, per esempio, e la citazione è d'obbligo a Padova, la patavinitas di Tito Livio con la libertas repubblicana. E quanto ha a che fare con la nostra idea di libertà, l'idea che ne aveva, per esempio, Cicerone. Egli, e cito un altro esempio, nel De Legibus ammetteva a malincuore la pratica del voto segreto, quello che oggi definiremmo una conquista democratica, ma pur ammettendola, Sosteneva che la tabella, oggi diremo la scheda elettorale, doveva essere mostrata dal popolo, dai votanti, agli ottimati, perché in base alla nostra legge, dice Cicerone, viene data solo l'apparenza della libertà, e lo diceva con sollievo, libertatis species, ma, per fortuna, viene mantenuta l'auctoritas nelle mani dei cittadini per bene. La libertas può diventare species libertatis. La libertà può trasformarsi in apparenza della libertà, trappola verbale pronta a scattare per legare anziché liberare le coscienze. A nostra tutela, contro la mistificazione, quali armi possediamo se non il sapere storico-critico e anche, perché no, 
la scienza del testo e l'amore per la parola. La ringraziamo, professoressa, e la ascoltiamo con grande piacere. Grazie professore e ora a presentare la nostra ospite chiamo qui la professoressa Annalisa Oboe, professoressa di letteratura inglese e studi postcoloniali e direttrice del centro di Ateneo Elena Cornaro per i saperi, le culture e le politiche di genere. Grazie. Buonasera, buonasera a tutte e a tutti, benvenute a questa Freedom Lecture con Mary Beard. Um, io sono veramente felicissima che lei sia qui con noi, sono felice di vedere tanta gente in questo pubblico, ma soprattutto tanti giovani che eh, si appassionano alle nostre humanities classiche, antiche, contemporanee, moderne. Questa è la ricchezza di quello che anche questa università offre. Eh, io, eh, prima di iniziare, ho questo, ho questo compito di introdurre eh, la nostra ospite, ma prima di iniziare vorrei davvero che la salutassimo, che salutassimo Mary Beard con un grandissimo caloroso applauso. Bene, allora l'abbiamo sentito, la pratica della libertà è radicata nella storia eh, dell'Università di Padova, eh, tanto da essere espressa nel motto che ci rappresenta, ma abbiamo pensato per gli 800 anni che perché il significato di questa parola non sviadisca né il suo valore venga dato per scontato, che serviva eh, riparlare di libertà. E quindi abbiamo dato vita alle Padua Freedom Lectures. E queste lectures, eh, dal, a partire dal 2020 in poi, sono diventate un momento cardine della vita della comunità universitaria di Padova perché ci offrono delle riflessioni di protagoniste e protagonisti di altissimo rilievo a livello internazionale che di volta in volta sono chiamati e chiamate a confrontarsi con aspetti e declinazioni dell'idea e dell'esercizio della libertà. Nei vari appuntamenti dal 2020 a oggi abbiamo avuto il privilegio di ospitare il grande filosofo di Strasburgo, Jean-Luc Nancy, sull'esperienza della libertà e su quando e come una persona è, può dirsi, può diventare autenticamente libera. Il premio Nobel per, la premio Nobel per la pace 2011, la giornalista Tawakol Karman, ci ha raccontato in che modo la libertà sia l'ingrediente fondamentale per costruire la pace e come la pace sia indispensabile all'esercizio della libertà. Poi la pluripremiata giornalista e scrittrice Rula Gebreal ha fornito un'importante testimonianza sulla subalternità femminile e su come le donne hanno, stanno costruendo un futuro finalmente inclusivo. Poi la senatrice a vita Elena Cattaneo, grande biologa e farmacologa italiana, ci ha raccontato e ci ha fatto comprendere il valore della libertà per l'indagine scientifica. Homi K. Baba, professor of the humanities all'Università di Harvard e uno dei principali teorici del postcolonialismo, ci ha parlato di libertà in rapporto ai nazionalismi contemporanei e al razzismo. Lo scrittore anglo-indiano giornalista antropologo Amitav Ghosh ha guardato criticamente a un'umanità che si è presa la libertà di distruggere il pianeta in cui viviamo, silenziando tutto ciò che non è umano. E poi David Grossman, il famosissimo scrittore israeliano, è intervenuto sul modo in cui le lettere, ovvero l'arte di figurare il mondo in breve carta, possono essere testimonianza e lotta per la conquista e la difesa dell'essenza profonda degli esseri umani. E in questa essenza c'è l'essere liberi. Oggi è il momento di Mary Beard, eh, che spero si trovi bene in compagnia di, chi, di queste voci importanti che l'hanno preceduta. Eh, siamo davvero grati che eh, abbia accettato il nostro invito a raccontarci come la libertà sia stata 
cercata, pensata, praticata nell'antichità e a riflettere su ciò che i classici possono ancora insegnarci sul rapporto tra libertà e potere, su come questo rapporto sia effettivamente un nodo centrale per il benessere delle culture e della società. Mary Beard è una classicista originale e autorevole, una voce inconfondibile e tra le più conosciute nel panorama contemporaneo sugli studi classici. Per dirla, permettetemelo, in linguaggio pop, è davvero una star. È professor, ehm, fino a poco tempo fa era professor of classics at Newnham College di Cambridge, editor per il, è tuttora editor per il settore dei classici del Times Literary Supplement, fa parte della British Academy e dell'American Academy of Arts and Sciences ed è fiduciaria del British, del British Museum. Fra le sue molte pubblicazioni ricordo Pompei, The Life of a Roman Town, vincitore del premio Wilson, e poi il suo bestseller SPQR, A History of Ancient Rome. Ricordo anche il suo popolarissimo blog sul TLS, che è stato raccolto nei volumi It's a Dawn's Life e All in a Dawn's, in a Dawn's Light Day, e poi il suo preziosissimo intervento su Women in Power e Manifesto, che continua a essere punto di riferimento del discorso femminista. Scrittrice, storica, filologa, presentatrice per la BBC di documentari seguitissimi, insignita dalla regina Elisabetta II del titolo di Dame Commander of the British Empire. Beard non si limita al mondo antico che spiega con passione e conoscenza in tv e nei suoi libri. L'importanza di parlare con tutti di tutto e di trovare la propria voce nel presente, nel nome della libertà, della parità, dell'inclusione, sono gli argomenti sui quali Mary Beard interviene, instancabile dal piccolo schermo, su Twitter, dalle pagine del Times Literary Supplement e di testate importanti come il Guardian, per esempio. Beard è diventata una colonna portante della vita culturale del suo paese. Usa il suo immenso sapere per intervenire sull'oggi, si espone, educa, viene criticata e risponde agli insulti sui social con intelligenza, con la profondità che applica allo studio dei classici. Il suo modo di essere pienamente intellettuale e umana risponde a quella necessità di essere worldly, di essere nel mondo, come diceva il grande Edward Said. E lei lo fa con humor ed energia, in un linguaggio comprensibile e divertente, mai scontato, di cui avremo prova ascoltando la sua lezione di oggi. Le lascio la parola ricordando che il titolo del suo intervento è On the Absence of Liberty, Living and Writing under a Roman Emperor. Now I invite our guest to come over and thank you. Please join me again in welcoming Mary Beard. Uh, buonasera. Uh, devo dire, sono lieta di essere qui a Padova e mi dispiace molto parlare in inglese. Ok, I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to turn your theme of liberty upside down. Or rather, I'm going to be talking about how you represent and understand the absence of liberty. And I shall be focusing on one classic Western example of that, the rule of the ancient Roman emperors, whether we call it one-man rule, autocracy, monarchy, or tyranny. My claim is that Roman writers were simultaneously much more acute and wide-ranging in reflecting on and theorizing about the absence of liberty than we usually allow. But we haven't always looked in the right place 
for their reflections or ask the right questions about what we read. I'm going to be taking you to stories of mad emperors, of luxurious dining, of fake food, swimming pools, and lethal jokes. But I'm going to be digging under the surface to expose some bigger issues. Now, the politics of liberty and its absence in the Roman Empire have most often been seen rather narrowly in terms of a clash between an overpowering emperor and an elite senatorial class disempowered by one-man rule. And indeed, there have been some specific and acute analyses, both ancient and modern, of the effects of tyranny on certain traditional political freedoms at Rome. One of the best and the most cynical and the most discussed is by Tacitus, writing in the second century AD about freedom of speech. In a famous passage of his Annals, he focuses on the fate of a historian in the reign of the emperor Tiberius by the name of Cremutius Cordus who had written in praise of the assassins of Julius Caesar. This was taken as treason against the imperial autocratic regime of which Caesar was seen as the founder. But before a verdict could be given in the trial that followed, Cordus had starved himself to death. And his offending books were burnt. Tacitus, who would, I'm sure, have expected his readers to know that the name Cremutius literally meant something like burning or blazing, Tacitus was pleased to say that some copies of his books had escaped the bonfire. So in a way, freedom had, he said, triumphed. Only in a way, of course, because they haven't actually managed to survive the centuries since. Um, they haven't come down to us, so ultimately I'm afraid Cremutius Cordus has been silenced. But beyond those kind of examples, there were plenty of nostalgic reflections during the rule of the Roman emperors, and echoed in modern studies too, looking back to the era of supposed liberty in the Republic and raising particular questions, such as, for example, whether good oratory could exist under autocracy. Had one man rule, they asked, killed not just free speech, had it killed speech itself? Though, as most historians would now say, how free or free for whom the free republic had ever been is a more complicated question than it looks. Now, I don't want, of course, to deny the importance of that kind of analysis, but I want to take a very different direction. I want to have another look at how Romans wrote about their emperors, and particularly at the apparently gossipy, unreliable ancient biographies of emperors, which are often treated now as no more than that, unreliable biographies. I want to suggest that they are more than that, and that they can involve very different attempts to theorizing what living under an autocracy is like and what lack of freedom means to the experience of being a citizen or even a human being. I'm going to be taking a broadly cognitive approach to the subject, exploring how, in some quite unexpected writing, Roman authors pointed to the effects of autocracy, the effects of the lack of freedom, on how the world was perceived. I want to start with what is apparently 
one of the most unreliable biographies ever written anywhere, and with the life of an emperor who has himself sometimes been dismissed as almost a fantasy. Uh, do we have a PowerPoint slide at this point? Do we think? I wanted to show you a picture of him. <laughs> but if not, not it doesn't matter. There were only little pictures. We'll wait and see. I, I will go on. There he is, right? He's, he's appeared, right? He is the Emperor Elagabalus, also known as Heliogabalus, who came to the throne aged 14 years old in 218 AD and was deposed four years later in 222. His family came from Emesa in Syria, which is modern Homs. His grandmother, Julia Miser, was the sister of Julia Domna, the wife of the Emperor Septimius Severus, and it was his grandmother who engineered his rise to the throne, and then four years and four marriages of Elagabalus later, it was grandmother again, so it was said, who engineered him off the throne, aged just 18. And she had him replaced by his younger cousin, Alexander Severus. In one of the dirtiest stories of imperial assassination, Elagabalus was supposedly killed in a latrine. The hit squad then tried to shove his body into a sewer, and when they couldn't get it in, they threw it in the Tiber. The stories about Elagabalus are lurid, and as I've hinted, they are unbelievable. They're told mainly in the writing of two more or less contemporary historians in the third century CE, and in a long biography, or at least long by ancient standards, which is part of one of the most puzzling works of literature to survive from the ancient world. It is a series of lives of emperors from Hadrian on, known as the Augustan History, which claims to be a composite work by six writers, different ones taking different emperors, composed at the end of the third century AD. In fact, modern analysis has shown conclusively that it was the work of one writer only, writing about 100 years later than that. Now, why on earth any single person wrote a whole volume of biographies pretending to be six people, writing 100 years earlier than he was actually writing, is a complete mystery. Was it a joke, some people have thought? If so, it was a very cumbersome and time-consuming joke. Was it a satiric construction of a bored 4th or 5th century professor on his evenings off with nothing better to do? Was it an attempt to expose the ambivalences and contradictions of the historical process? We really, really don't know. It is certainly, as you'll see, full of fiction, fantasy, and exaggeration about its emperors. At one point in his account of Elagabalus here, even the writer says that what he has written cannot possibly be true. But for me, that's what makes it a wonderful magnifying lens through which to see the embedded critiques of autocracy. And it's from where most, not all, but most of my discussion of Elagabalus comes from. On the usual reading, it shows us a caricature of the young emperor as the ultimate rule breaker, a transgressor who outdid such imperial monsters as Caligula or Nero. The tales told about him, and not only in the Augustan history, are unremittingly hostile in ancient terms and often in modern terms too. From the charges of child sacrifice, 
to choosing his advisors by the size of their genitals, to establishing a woman's senate, although that doesn't seem so bad to us, or never wearing the same pair of shoes twice. Right? Now, that, interestingly, is a trope of dictators and dynasts at many different periods of history. And it was a famous excess reported in the 20th century of Imelda Marcos of the Philippines, though I think significantly, perhaps, after Imelda Marcos's death, they never found the shoes. So presumably, it was a myth all along. There are also stories that he attempted a revolution in the religious structure of the Roman state, replacing Jupiter as the head of the Roman pantheon with the god Elagabal of his native Emesa and whose priest he was and from whom the name that we use of him derives. Other stories say that he challenged what we would now call binary views of gender, insisting that he be addressed as a woman, and even, in one account, asking for a surgical transition. Though, to add to the complexity, he also had those four heterosexual marriages between the ages of 14 and 18. But it was around the banqueting table that the excesses and transgressions of Elagabalus came into sharpest focus. Beyond some particularly intricate delicacies of haute cuisine, he would, for example, serve colour-coded dinner parties consisting of all green food or all red food. He also had a fondness for humiliating his guests. It was at dinner that he seated some of those he'd invited on inflatable cushions that were gradually deflated during the evening, leaving the guests on the floor. In English, we call those whoopee cushions, and uh, Elagabalus is the first person in recorded history ever to have had fun with them. On other occasions, he would ridicule his guests in different ways, lining up, for example, eight bald men to share his dinner, or eight one-eyed men, or eight gouty men, or eight very fat men who made everybody else laugh because they couldn't actually fit all together on the dining couches. A cruel joke, right? Or he would release tame lions and leopards into the room over the dessert course, terrifying the guests who didn't realise that the lions and leopards were actually tame. But sometimes his guests really did die. And we can have the next slide on the PowerPoint. On one occasion, in a moment memorably captured, in this British 19th century painting, he showered his guests with so many rose petals that they were smothered to death. You can see uh, he's the guy at the top um, looking at the scene. And if we put the next PowerPoint slide on, I think you'll see that some of the guests under the rose petals are just beginning to realize what's happening, and others are still blissfully unaware of what's coming. But the message is clear. Even when an emperor is generous, he can kill you. Now, I'm sure it's not difficult to imagine what most modern historians have done with all this. Some have simply dismissed it, regarding it as no more than fantasy, right? Pointing, for example, to the fact that what independent evidence we have for the workings of the Roman Empire at this period shows business going on pretty much as usual, not being organized at the whim of some mad teenage ruler, right? Um, and we'll put the last slide on now, um, which just shows you his formal official image 
on a Roman coin, where he looks a lot older than 18. Others have not dismissed it, but they've tried to see through the extravagant accounts to a rather more mundane truth underneath or they've tried to sieve the evidence, to sort the evidence out, rejecting the kind of outlandish details like the rose petal story, while attempting to construct a more plausible account from the bits that are left. There are huge methodological problems here. There are problems that hover over much modern historical writing on the ancient world, namely, what criteria do we use to decide which elements of the accounts that come down to us are true in the narrow sense of the word? Now, I want to leave those problems on one side, and even assuming that the stories of Elagabalus are largely a mixture of fantasy, exaggeration, and misunderstanding, I want to ask, what truth, at a higher level, this kind of fantasy is offering us. And my main point is that the crimes of Elagabalus, as they are presented, are not random acts of madness. They follow a logic, when taken, which, taken together, characterizes, I think, in a quite clever way, what autocracy gives you, what the effects of autocracy are, or what the consequences of the absence of liberty are. They construct a version of one-man rule as a peculiar kind of dystopia in which the rules of nature and the social conventions of meaning are flouted or suspended, in which nothing is as it seems, and in which you can never believe your eyes. As one of my students, when I was talking about this, nicely put it, the Roman message here around Elagabalus is that, in his words, autocracy destroys autopsy. Autocracy destroys our ability to trust our senses or to trust in the reality of what we think we see. To turn that the other way around, the message is that it is liberty that guarantees that we can believe our eyes. What I'm saying is that Elagabalus is not just one example of a bad emperor, and there are plenty of those, he stands for what is the matter with imperial rule as a whole. He's written up as the ultimate extreme of Roman autocracy. And that, incidentally, is partly signaled by his name. I, I've been calling him, as he's now usually known, Elagabalus, or sometimes Heliogabalus. He was never actually called that. That is a name that is based simply on his favorite god. In fact, he doesn't really have a name. One ancient author, not the Augustan history, simply lists his nicknames, ending up with Tiberinus from the name of the river in which he died. The Augustan history itself refers to his birth name, Varius, which he's never in his rule known by. And it points out that that literal meaning of that word, varied or various, was a signal of his plurality and uncertainty. In a way, Elagabalus or various is every emperor or perhaps none. But let me just explain a bit more fully what I mean by all this. Out of the range of stories that are told or invented about him, many focus on the way he subverts the natural order of things. He has piles of snow in his gardens in the summer, not in the winter. He never eats seafood when he's by the coast. 
but only inland. He fills his inland swimming pools with seawater only, and he sleeps during the day and is awake through the night. Now, to some extent, those ideas fit with other critiques of ancient tyranny, that the tyrant claims to be able to defy nature. The free Greeks, for example, decried the Persian king Xerxes for bridging the Hellespont as if he could control the sea, a feat that was reputedly parodied by the emperor Caligula. And when Julius Caesar reformed the Roman calendar, changing the length of the Roman year, he was accused of bossing around the stars in the sky. Freedom, in other words, underlying these stories, freedom is the freedom to live in accordance with nature. But more interesting, I think, is the effect of autocracy on how the world seems. The regime of the tyrant is a regime of, to put it slightly flowerily, uh, is a regime of sensory destabilization. The imperial palace is a world full of fakes, and the closer you get to the emperor himself, the more fake it is. One of Elagabalus' tricks, we are told, is to invite many guests to his grand banquets, but to serve real food only to the elite guests and fake food made of wood or wax to the lower status guests. So they had what looked like a delicious banquet in front of them, but was actually entirely inedible. His lions are terrifying because they look fierce, but they're actually tame. And in conservative Roman terms, though I would stress no longer ours, he is a man, but he claims to be a woman. He is, as the writer of the imperial biography sums it up, Elagabalus is as fake as his name. But that destabilization goes beyond simple fakery, wax food rather than real food, to undermining the very nature of what representation and reality are. One passing accusation in the biography is that whenever adultery was shown on stage, Elagabalus made the actors really do it. Now, of course, the implication could be that he just wanted a more sexually explicit show. But the more important logic here is that in Elagabalus' dystopian world, the distinction between representation and reality is forgotten or confused. To put that another way, the power of autocracy breaks the social rules of meaning by literalizing metaphor and symbol, or by failing to see what a symbol, or for that matter, a play, is. We can see that in religious symbolism too. When Elagabalus wants to link his own particular cult to the sacred flame of the goddess Vesta at the very heart of Roman religion, tended by six Vestal virgins, what does he do? He marries a Vestal virgin. That is to say, he misreads, oversimplifies, and literalizes the complexity of religious symbol by turning it into banal, human sex. Now, as I said, my claim is that this is not a pile-up of random acts of madness. There is a critical Roman discourse about autocracy and liberty embedded in this that is not merely about the transgressions of one individual emperor. It points to 
a particular Roman formulation of the theoretical problems of one-man rule that go far beyond clashes about freedom of speech or freedom of political expression. Autocracy, these stories tell us, subverts not only nature, but it subverts the social conventions of meaning and representation by which we live. It trades simultaneously in pretense and play acting, where there should be truth, and in misconstruing the language of symbol as if it were sensible reality. To turn that on its head, it is only liberty that guarantees that what you think you see is real and that the codes of symbolic representation remain symbolic. Liberty, the Romans, for some Romans I'm saying, protects how things mean. Now, I've so far concentrated on just one emperor who was written up, whatever the historical facts, as a kind of extreme case of Roman tyranny. But it's also a case that sensitizes us to the questions of true perception and the validity of social meaning that we find throughout Roman discussions of what imperial autocracy adds up to, and that are just as important as whether senators are able to speak their mind and stand up to the ruler. Repeatedly, even if not in quite such flagrant ways, Roman writers return to the regime of the emperors as one in which you can never know what is true, in which even the criteria of truth are always uncertain. I think in particular of the ultimate centerpiece and guarantor of Roman power, that is military victory and its celebration. One question that is repeatedly asked is, could you ever know if the military heroics of a Roman emperor were true? Did they ever actually happen at all? The answer was, you couldn't. And that is an absolutely fundamental challenge to Roman truth in its barest essentials. Now, two of the funniest and most pointed examples of this come from the first century AD, more than 100 years before Elagabalus. Both the emperors Caligula and Domitian, it was said, celebrated or planned to celebrate triumphal processions to mark victories over the Germans, which had been, at the very least, massively exaggerated and maybe never happened at all. These triumphal processions, a custom which went back to the very origins of Rome, were central to Roman identity and self-imaging. Successful generals, or to see it from the other side, those who had presided over the bloodiest massacres of the enemy, drove in a chariot through the streets of the city, dressed in the costume of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, with their soldiers streaming behind them, their captive prisoners and their loot walking in front. But how could you have a triumphal procession if you didn't have any prisoners, if you've not actually taken any. Caligula's answer, it was said, was to dress up some friendly Gauls as Germans, to dye their hair red, to teach them a bit of the German language, and give them German names. You can have pretend prisoners. Domitian's solution was similar, though with an added extra. To take the place of the non-existent booty, he raided the palace store cupboards and pre presented that as if it was what he'd taken in Germany. This is more than just ridiculous. The message was, where the emperor was concerned, even in the triumph, you could never believe what you thought you saw. That was the case in a rather different way in the early second century AD. The emperor Trajan 
had scored some very temporary victories in a hit-and-run campaign in Mesopotamia. He then died, and the territories that he'd taken had already been given up by his successor, Hadrian, who nevertheless staged a triumphal procession with a wax model of Trajan in the chariot. It was, in other words, a pretend triumph for fake conquests of territories that had already been abandoned by an emperor who was anyway already dead. Now, that's fakery for you. Another way of framing this, of course, would be in terms of reality versus stage performance. Liberty guaranteed reality Autocracy could only ever be a charade. That was why the Emperor Nero's performances on stage were so loaded and so derided by Roman writers. In a sense, they were admission that the Emperor was, after all, only an actor. But the irony was that that admission was said to have been built into the imperial regime from the very start and by the best emperor of all, the first emperor, Augustus. His elaborate deathbed scene in 14 AD, when he was well into his 70s, was famous. In one account, true or not, he asked for a mirror. Um, he had his hair combed and asked his friends if he had played the comedy of life well. And he added on a couple of lines of verse. Since I have played my part well, give me a clap and dismiss me from the stage with applause. Being an emperor, in other words, was an act. It was as unreal as playing a part on the stage. To sum up then, it's often assumed that most Roman writers had relatively little to contribute to debates on liberty and autocracy in a general sense. They were concerned rather with the particular differences between a good and a bad emperor individually, or, and this is true even of Tacitus, with the sectional interests of the traditional senatorial class in the regime of one-man rule. My point is that there is much, much more to Roman writing than that, if we are prepared to take it seriously. Embedded in what we often write off as trivia is a very strong theoretical position on the corrosive power of tyranny, which goes far beyond the power struggles between the elite and the emperor. Tyranny, in other words, I think this is what these accounts are saying, tyranny the absence of liberty is a cognitive assault. The absence of liberty disrupts the senses, it justifies falsehoods, and it turns the world into a distorting mirror. The more distorting, the closer to the emperor you get. And I think that's a message that we can all, even now, reflect on. Thank you.
Adesso funziona. Grazie. Thank you so much, Mary Beard, for such a great, accessible, and at the same time, complex talk, lecture. Um, I hope uh, the people who got it in translation had the same pleasure out of it as, as we did while listening to her speaking. And um, what we're going to do now is to um, have a little chat in English. Uh, the translation is still on, and then we'll open to the floor for your questions and our answers, her answers. Um, oh, no, no, <laughs> I wouldn't dare. Okay, um, perhaps I, I would just like to start with a question which immediately will reveal that I am no classicist. <laughs> Although I'm a humanist when I deal with the contemporary mostly in cultural studies, so you will forgive me if I misread you. But I, I would like to uh, try and make sense of one of the major um, issues that uh, you developed in, in your talk, uh, which is the gap between truth and representation. Um, so you, you, you told us about the, um, the narrative on the extravagances of Heliogabalus and other emperors. Um, and you say that real facts or the truth may disappear, but you make clear that what remains and what we should pay attention to is precisely that the extravagant narration itself is key to reading, understanding, identifying absolute power. In other words, the mode of representation of the life and times of the emperor is as unnatural and incredible as the performance itself of absolute power. And in this way, it exposes the workings of autocracy. As the staging of Augustus' death shows, uh, power uses fiction as a tool for producing itself and reproducing itself. So my question concerns the other kinds of truth uh, beside the factual ones, which reading, somewhat I would say deconstructively, may reveal. It concerns your method of reading classical documents, which looks for the ideological work going on in the text, behind the text, and is perhaps less philological, less historical, and more political. So is this a commonly accepted practice in the classical world? I'm asking about your work, really. <laughs> I'm asking about your work. Right. 
writer is saying, before we start to chop it around and make it make sense in our terms. Now, maybe that we can, we can really, we can start to listen to what these people are saying. And I think, by and large, there are, there are very few people in the world, there are some, but there are a few people who would say that the Romans were, um, had got really sophisticated views about autocracy. And in fact, one of the things that might be said is what is very disappointing about the Roman Empire is that it doesn't produce a sophisticated theorization in opposition or in favor of itself. Well, I, I think that's because we've not, we've, we've been deaf to hearing what they were saying. Now, in a way, that's a, you know, I'm being a bit naive, but I think a bit of intentional naivety can sometimes open up um, a channel to a different way of seeing things. Um, no, I don't think it was Sorry, so it's not just what they were saying, but possibly also how they were saying it? <laughs> around 400, who writes history pretending not to be himself, pretending to be six of them, and we can be 100% certain from linguistic analysis that he's one person, and that he's uh, writing, but he's pretending to write earlier than he is. Now, that is, that is telling you about someone grappling with what it is to write history. Now, I don't know what they're grappling with exactly, and I don't know what they're trying to tell us. And it is, uh, a, it is a fantasy book. Uh, um, but I think we, we, we need to think about how they are trying to mean things and what the meaning might be. Um, rather than, you know, rather than do what I did, which is, you know, basically you go through with a pencil and you cross out all the things that you think, well, that can't have happened. And then, then you look at what's left, and then what gets worse, when you look at what's left, you then, I don't know if in Italy you have those with children's games, which are joining the dots, right? And you have the, the joining the dots is always fascinating because it always ends up with a really weird animal, which you could never have suspected it was when you just saw the dots. Well, traditional ancient history tries to join the dots, I think. It, it gets rid of the rubbish, then it puts all the dots in a page, and then it tries to produce uh, an image, which is slightly strange, but still believable. And it's, I mean, I'd throw it all out. That's the kind of thing. I'll leave it to Margarita to introduce now. Thank you, Annalisa. And um, while listening to Mary Baird's uh, thought provoking and eye-opening lecture, I uh, have realized once more how crucial the reflection on liberty and power is in the whole Greek and Roman historiography. And such centrality, for example, explains how profound and how sophisticated the Greek or Roman reflection on the types of government is. And it has even been written that Greek historiography as a whole uh, is a history of the relations of power and more broadly, perhaps, we could argue that freedom and power, or in other words, the relations of power, are crucial not only, not only in the realm of ancient historiography, but in many other ancient texts um, and literary genres. I must mention, of course, the true milestone of Sophocles' Antigone, which represents how harsh and level, uh, level the conflict between individuals and power can be. And now, having listened to your lecture, uh, after you explained to us that the ancient Greeks and Roman, Romans have recognized freedom as the true core of social life, 
I dare say that perhaps Greeks and Romans have seen, considered, and described the centrality of the relations of power and the consequences of power and power politics, perhaps more profoundly and more acutely than we do in our times. And immediately after 9-11, on the London Review of Books, uh, um, he wrote that, how I quote, However tactfully you dress it up, the US had it coming. In the sense, of course, that there was a connection between American geopolitics and the immense tragedy of 9-11. And maybe she was harshly criticized at that time. <laughs> but now that still every day we are staring, astonished as we all are, at the consequences of the, of the politics of power, we can perhaps go back to the Peloponnesian War, which lasted 30 years and was, and is, the story of the failure of the coexistence of two polis, each of them exercising its own politics of power in the same geopolitical scenario. And now that the geopolitical scenario is as wide as the whole world, as our planet, I wonder, and I take the liberty to ask you, what the ancient text can tell us <laughs> on the politics of power and on, on its well, consequences. And I am not sure yeah. that the ancient text can really teach us anything, but I'm certain that we can't learn from them. So, by the way, can they still talk to us and rescue us anyhow? Um, I'd, I'd like to say yes, and I don't, think, I don't think that's the right answer. I mean, I, I think that you're right about the fundamental nature of liberty within ancient discourse. I think that people have been prepared to accept, perhaps too easily to accept that in relation to Greek political thinking and too reluctant to accept that uh, in relation to Roman. I mean, Romans are basically defined as not having political thinking, really. That's, that's what marks you out as a Roman. You, know? you have good emperors or bad emperors, but you don't theorize empire. Um, so one of the things I want to do is I want to put the Romans back in the picture. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think it's very, very rare that the ancients actually teach us something about ourselves that we can take, just take off the peg and say, oh, right, you know, you know I know that there are um, right-wing military academies in uh, the United States who think that that is possible, and I, I don't think it, it is. I, I, I have found myself reflecting on the, the nature of tyranny in relation to the nature of dystopian removal of sensible reality. Um, uh, now, I will tell one story about, you know, against the British, really, but, um, you know, uh, that's very easy to see in terms of the fictitious presentation of photographs, which we associate with... Um, Soviet Russia, but is you know the, actually the photograph that you see of the lineup of people isn't the lineup of people. Um, I I think that if you gave me a bit of time and you promised not to report this in any newspaper, I, I think I would say that you might have seen that there might be something like this in our recent monarch's funeral in the United Kingdom. I mean, you know, in some ways the most amazing. Uh, you know, brilliantly exercised um, choreography of the ceremonies of death. I mean, in a sense, it was a, a desperate attempt to make Britain look like power. Um, uh, and you know, it did that at the cost of some um, poor Marines pulling the coffin and a lot of people dressed in very silly clothes. Um, <laughs> No, I, you know, I was watching it moved as well, you know, so I'm not, I'm not going to say that these things are just that, but I think the idea of um, the layers of deception that we don't see through, um, I, I think you could do much the same for Trump's America. 
um, about what's real and what's not, starting with Mr. Trump's hair, for a start, would be, you know, one, one place. So that idea that, that you can't read about these things and you can't be in proximity to these things without entering a world in which nothing is as it seems. And to give you just one more example before I shut up, and I'm sorry it is about the royal family, but in a sense they're safe territory. Um, British newspapers, when many of you are too young to remember this, but when Colonel Gaddafi uh, of Libya was still alive, he was often photographed with a whole array of medals, you know, go all down his chest. And British newspapers would always say, oh, how ridiculous, you know, this is a Ruritanian vision of empire. You know, we see our young princes of the royal family uh, who actually never served in the army at all, getting dressed up in all this stuff and medals and we don't see that we're the same. And, and the, the, the idea that it's not just about fakery, it's about um, not seeing the lies that we've been taught to believe. If I may, I want to carry on this uh, discussion, moving it a little bit, uh, but it has, still has to do with freedom. And, uh, and nature, which you mentioned, you see them as strictly connected, almost inherent in the human. And in your analysis, absolute power is represented as unnatural. While freedom belongs, it seems to me, to the order of the natural. And I was wondering whether this means that we need to find the seeds of our contemporary human rights discourse in the classical world much you know, long before the French Revolution and uh, the International um, 1948 uh, Agreement. Your summary is absolutely correct. That is what I said. When I hear you summarise it, I feel slightly um, ashamed because I think um, the other thing that we know is that um, um, almost any human institution that claims to be living with nature um, is a social construct and has socially constructed nature um, I to, for the to, to, Sorry. You know, to, to fit. Uh, and so um, I, you know, I, I think the more you try to pin this down, the more, um, I don't think difficulties with my argument, but the more my argument seems not a kind of clear template, but a series of dives into uh, and across um, those issues rather than a neat summation of them. I mean, that's why, I mean, one of the things I felt that I was doing, and it's, they cut, two, they cut in completely different ways, is to say um, the, the tyrant disallows nature in different forms but also simultaneously doesn't understand the nature of symbol. <laughs> and they're doing it at the same, they're doing it at the same time. They're, so when Ella Gabalus says to the actors, you're carrying out adultery on stage, do it. In some ways, that's a misapplication of nature because he has not understood that actors don't do it. Um, uh, and yet, the other side of it is that he will not live by the natural rhythms of the world. Now, in some ways, of course, we would say, look, what civilization consists in is not having to live by the natural. Um, you know, central heating, air conditioning, you know, that is... And so you could write the talk that I've just given by, by as you say, using the terms nature, by, by making the, putting central cult, nature and culture and seeing that what these Roman writers are doing 
is already seeing the complicated relationship between nature and culture. We'll be in a, I mean, it wouldn't make such a good uh, talk to the theme of liberty, but it would be another way of doing that, I think. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, please. May focus once more on power, but not on classics and power, but on power and your uh, research. In your preface to her book on laughter in ancient Rome, you claimed, to be honest, I'm quoting, I am, I am getting fed up with being told that laughter is all about power. And she adds, true, but what cultural form is not? Yes. <laughs> I have the sort of feeling that a wide part of your bibliography is a reflection on power. And of course, as you said, everything is about power. Laughter is a matter of power. Gender is a matter of power. The and you wrote women and power. The representation of emperors about. is a matter of power. And we, could also, we should also mention your, the book you edited in the 90s, a pre pagan priest, <laughs> priest uh, religion and power. And the ancient history is a matter of power and liberty, as, it, as we have said. In a long and fascinating interview to the New Yorker, you recalled Moses Finlay's seminars in Cambridge and uh, focusing on slavery, debt, poverty, on the fragility of democracy. Moses Finley, you said, was rethinking re re the past, reworking, you said, the way we think about the past. As a historian, you have, you has, you have explored a very wide variety of cultural forms, each of them being all about power somehow. And so I'm wondering how much your focus on power is the result of your work on, cultural, on the cultural forms of antiquity and whether you would have, would have focused on power even if you were, let's say, a historian of Middle Ages or an early modern yeah. historian. Uh, I feel um, a little bit shifty about that because um, you're right, you know, that I can go through one book after the next and say um, it's power um, and different forms of power. And I did, when I was doing laughter, you know, this is in a kind of the layered way you were talking about. I got fed up by being taken out to lunch, usually by men older than myself, who proceeded to lecture me on what laughter was, and it always came down to power. You know, and I felt like saying, I bloody know that, you know. Um, and so, uh, you know, the discourse of power is used to disempower the, what I was then, the younger scholar. And I see thinking about power as extremely important. And I think that revealing, this is to go back to nature, um, revealing, you know, particularly you might say, um, gender relations as being bound up in a way that no one who is embarking on kind of living those relations realizes is about power, but is in some ways. But then I think, well, okay, so where have you got now? You said it's all about power. Well, yeah. So what? Um, you know, Foucault told us that, you know, did we need all this stuff? Um, and uh, so I feel both, as it were, analytically empowered by thinking about power and thinking about the way different human relations in antiquity, but I think anywhere, any place, anywhere, any place. But at which point you say, well, so the history of the world is a history of power, is it? Well, I suppose it is. But then it's not very interesting. Um, because it, you know, it's a question of how do you inject difference into that? And I don't know. I just don't know. Um, this is a huge question, and I would let it resonate. <laughs> uh, but first, I would like to ask whether there are urgent questions from the floor before we leave. Okay, so there's a couple of questions here. Can, can they have a microphone, please? 
Thank you. Here, here in the front. Qui davanti. Okay, if you say your name and perhaps stand up, we, we can all see you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anche parlare in italiano se vuole. Um, Sarà tradotto. Preferirei l'inglese se posso. <laughs> Um, this is my, my question, or two questions. I would like to know uh, what is that story, that anecdote about uh, Emperor Elogabalus, uh, about this claimed gender transition, telling us about the anxieties or the gender contractions of the time. Um, my second question would be how important it is to have a gender approach to understand uh, how important it is to have a gender approach to understand Roman uh, or Greek uh, or Greece, why we don't see very often these approaches on um, modern uh, researches. Thank you. I think that on the, the first question about uh, Elagabalus's non-binary gender. Um, interestingly, the stories about surgical transition come not from the Augustan history, but from one of the contemporary history writers. Um, it, for me now, it fits very much and it, into a changing vision of the ancient world that I think our debates about non-binary gender have opened up, really, um, leaving aside the truth or falsehood. Um, I was brought up to learn and to teach the idea that ancient Greece and Rome were absolutely... Um, were based on a firm division between male and female. That that was, that was the point of um, it, gender discussions in antiquity were insisting on the absolute difference between male and female. What I'm amazed at now, and I think our eyes have been opened by, or my eyes have been opened by new debates on gender, I'm just amazed at what we had not to look at in order to sustain that view that the ancient world was absolutely committed to binary gender division. The example of um, Elagabalus is just one thing that it, it, I suppose it got thrown out by said fantasy, fantasy. You know, it got put into the this is completely unbelievable um, pot and never looked at. But I, I think it, I now see that those stories about Elagabalus actually fit with quite a lot of discussion in, particularly in mythical discourse, about the potential slippage between man and woman. And the, perhaps the, uh, uh, The clearest example um, is the famous sculptor, sculpture, which there are several copies, um, uh, one in the Borghese collection in Rome, one in the Louvre, of the sleeping hermaphrodite. Um, the a figure lying down, uh, you approach it from behind and it looks like a woman, Um, fem apparently female hair, you go around the other side and you find it has breasts and male genitals. I, when I first learned about that, I learned about it as a joke. I was, we learned about it as, this is a very kind of interesting Hellenistic joke. You can just imagine, can't you? Uh, you're at dinner and you walk, uh, uh, you, you walk up behind the statue and then you go around the other side and you say, oh, ha, ha, how funny, right? And I taught that line. You know, I'm ashamed to say I taught it. And now I see that embedded in quite a lot of discussions in the myth of the ancient world is 
questions which are, are trying to uh, challenge the notion of binary gender. And Elagabalus is the story of Elagabalus, seems to me one of them. Hermaphrodite is others. You can find plenty of, in Ovid of, of others. And, you know, Tiresias, you know, the figure of Tiresias in, in Greek myth, who actually had spent time as a woman, you know, and, you know, the famous, he was asked a famous question who enjoys sex more, um, women or men? And um, because Tiresias had been both a woman and a man, he could tell you that it was women. Now, it, this seems to me as much an eye-opener of our modern debates about trans identity as looking in the 1960s and 70s, you know, suddenly refinding the women in antiquity when we hadn't realized they were there. Right? Now, now I think I'm seeing all the time, predictably, you know, any society which invests in, um, in huge amounts of binary division also invests in the deconstruction of that. And so I think it's, uh, I'm not certain that I go along with some members of the trans community who want Elagabalus, the real Elagabalus, to be the first trans ruler. Um, you know, I, I, that's when I become a slightly old-fashioned Cambridge positivist and I say, I'm not really sure that absolutely that's the case. But, the, but ideologically, it's part of something which is really important. Now, the second question was about gender, was it? It was about how, I mean, I, I, I'm in a way slightly surprised that you asked that question because I think that some of my colleagues in Cambridge um, would say, God, can't you people stop talking about gender in ancient history? You know, isn't, you know, haven't we seen enough of that? Um, you know, is that the only, is, is that the only thing that you think is a, you know, is, is really worth talking about? It seems to me that, you know, and this is, I suppose, this is my generation's discovery, um, that you cannot read any bit of ancient literature, I'm, I'm just trying to think whether then there's, you know, I'm sure somebody will come up with an exception, but in which actually notions of gender are not being looked at head on, um, even if it's by exclusion. Um, I think, I think I'd say that. You know, I'm trying to think, I wonder if, you know, the GTS is, um, you know, um, a long essay on military equipment might be a difficulty to fit into gender, but I think otherwise, it's, you know, I, I think our understanding of the works of Cicero, our understanding of, of oratorical uh, invective is incomprehensible without, uh, without putting gender center stage, actually, I think. Um, there are many questions, so um, I wonder Thank you. whether any of the questions are about women and power, since we're talking about gender. No. Is it? No. Oh, no okay, I will ask the questions. A there's a hand there? Yes. Oh, good evening, Professor Beard. Uh, I'm a student uh, studying a master's degree of classical literature and uh, Asian history. Uh, and I've been greatly inspired for the female perspective in many of your narrative or uh, history uh, events or periods, such as your uh, account on the intervention of the Sabine women and the women, women in Pompeii. And uh, as we all know, uh, in a traditional historical narrative, women are often uh, invisible, or I should say uh, they are, uh, they are, uh, uh, they are um, a kind of uh, despised or ignored. Uh, so uh, actually, as a half of human beings, uh, women's influence on history uh, goes, for, uh, goes for her beyond uh, her uh, goes far beyond that. So I would like to ask you that, uh, in your opinion, is there a need for more powerful and a stronger research uh, and a narrative from a female perspective uh, in today's research 
uh, on ancient history, classics, etc. Uh, and of course, even uh, in research of ancient Chinese history, uh, we also have this kind of problem, uh, a very similar phenomenon. Uh, so uh, will our women strive for uh, more of the rights to write, uh, to uh, explore history, to record history, uh, or to narrative history? Uh, just as a model as you as you does, uh, that's all for my question. Thank you. Um, can I just say that? I mean, I think what underlies part of what you've said um, is the idea that we have to make people visible in history. It's and that there is the, that. Uh, and we have to stop our blind spots. And this goes back to um, the, your question, that um, people often say, we don't see the, the women, we don't see the non-binary gender, we don't see the slaves. But that is in part because we have chosen not to see them. And I think what, what happens in the way history changes is that we, op we, we allow ourselves to see. And uh, just to give one example about slaves, you can go around a museum display, you can look at um, uh, all, let's say, fine silverware from the ancient world. And people will say, oh, you know, you don't see anything of the slaves here. And then you say, who do you think cleaned this silverware? You know, who washed it up? Who put it in the cupboard? And that you need to be able to open up the possibility of seeing those other people. Um, and that, I think, is what changes all the time, actually, who, who we choose to look at. Yes, so probably you also have to open up the possibility of hearing other people. <laughs> and women have been silenced over the centuries since, since classical times. But I, I know there are other questions. Yes, uh, at the back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Claudia Padovani from uh, Department of Politics, Law and International Studies. And I would like to uh, slightly shift uh, the topic. I think one of the terms you used uh, that I will take with me is the cognitive assault that you use to describe tyranny. And I think this is not a one-man kind of work. I think if we see <laughs> from the account uh, that there is a performance, uh, there's a stage, uh, there's a number of people involved with this, uh, so if I take this to contemporary times, it would be just too easy to refer to maybe propaganda and fake news. I would like to take this maybe to a more Italian experience, whereby at some time around 12 years ago, the entire Italian parliament was convinced to acknowledge that a certain young woman was the niece of Hosni Mubarak, and there was a performance on stage so I think my question is, is um, if we understand uh, this kind of performance uh, and the, the cognitive assault as uh, requiring the, the, the action and participation of a number of people that complexify the whole point of power and freedom, and I, would, I wonder what, how would you uh, maybe respond to that? Thank you. Um, I'd say I absolutely agree. And I, I think that... Um, one of the things the matter with what I said, and I would say um, this is partly because I was trying to be quite brief, is that um, it looked as if it was a story of individuals. And I think just to kind of add to the complexity about the absence of liberty is that, of course, it's not as if there's one tyrant over there and we are all um, somehow um, his victims. Um, we are, in, in many ways, many of us are at least partly complicit in the cognitive assault that is being, um, uh, that is being worked on us. You know, we go to dinner with Elagabalus, 
and we get put fake food in front of us, and we don't say, excuse me, this is fake. I can't eat this. Why have I come to dinner? We sit there and we play the, the game of the, um, of the fakery. So we are, we are actually complicit in being actors ourselves when we, we sit looking charmingly and probably we take it away at the end of dinner, this lovely wooden apple which we can't eat. And then we take it back home and we put it on the mantelpiece and we say, I got that from the emperor. So we, we become, um, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's not him versus the rest of us that, this, that the absence of liberty, it makes us all guilty of the dystopia in which um, we live. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, can, yeah, yeah. So I absolutely agree. Are there, yeah, there was a question here. Good evening, Professor. Um, I just wanted to go back a little bit to Roman history, actually. Um, and I was particularly struck by what you said about, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned Julius Caesar and um, the, his reform of the calendar, actually. And the, the jibe that you mentioned was by Caesar because he said. Um, and the point is, the reform of the calendar that he did was actually to give an order to time. Because the calendar that was there was not corresponding to the actual year anymore. So actually, the person who is generally considered to be the head, well, the, let's say the starter of autocracy in the Roman world, might actually have been the one that was trying to not go against the laws of nature. No, I, I mean, I think that's extremely interesting um, because you, you know, that's another level of the, as it were, fakery because Julius... Well, the, the point about the calendar, there is no natural calendar. <laughs> and, you know, one of the things that, we, that nature makes it impossible to do is to align the lunar calendar with the solar calendar. So nobody can ever have a natural calendar. So the... The injecting nature into that is always a kind of cultural, um, it's always a cultural weapon. Um, but I suppose what I would say is two things. I mean, yeah, I, I learned, you know, thank God Julius Caesar got some clever Egyptians who explained to him how to run a calendar, and then the Roman calendar, instead of being manipulated by, um, awful politicians for their own interests followed nature. And that is, that is one way of seeing it, and you, you're absolutely right. Except that's not how it was received, or at least, you know, there's Cicero saying, um, that is, you know, you, you, he's telling the stars in the sky what to do. And one of the things that is very clear is that, um, uh, a, a common critique of the autocrat is he changes time. He changes the months, he changes the, the length of the year. Now, actually, you're absolutely right. The, when nature isn't really involved in this at all, except nature is what is used in the critique of the autocrat. He thinks he can transcend nature. Uh, and his response, presumably, is, I'm getting nature right, you idiot. Um, but I think that's another way, of, in, you know, a bit like the idea of our com complicity in th that, that it's, it's, it's much more ambivalent when you start to, to push any um, example you find that it becomes fractured and layered, although the same basic tropes, I think, remain. But yes. 
Hi. So um, I was just wondering, uh, because you talked a lot about uh, historical writings about emperors, but were Romans, according to you, aware of this relationship between truth and liberty? And should we, should we read the rest of the literature with that in mind? For example, I'm thinking about uh, Catullus 64, where he plays a lot with uh, beginning sentences and that unexpected ends. And so I was wondering if we should read that, we should have this sort of new point of view on literature. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's always very hard to know what to answer when you think, did Romans, you know, in general, outside the, the, the examples that we've got in literature. Um, and it's very hard to generalize. I think what I'd say is that those, the relationship between truth, liberty, and nature was available to argue with in different forms. Now, it crystallizes in, I've, I think, the, the kind of extreme discourse around one, as it were, non-existent almost emperor, which is Elagabalus, one constructed. But I think that you see those issues in play um, in a, perhaps an attenuated, more diffuse form in, in lots of other places in Roman literature. I mean, you know, to be honest, let me not give the wrong impression. Elagabalus is not the only rich Roman who was reputed to serve fake food to his guests. Um, uh, what you get in Elagabalus is all that comes together. But you know, the, the notion of well, you know, it's, it goes back to something that I talked about in the laughter book, and I hadn't really, I suppose, till you asked that question, um, seen this. But it's the question of how, in Rome of how do I know who I am, and the the there's a whole strand of ancient joking, which picks up that theme outside the theme of. Um, of imperial power and the absence of liberty. It's about what, you know, what's it like living in a culture with no mirrors? What's it like living in a culture where actually uh, the, the, the center of the eye is the ego doesn't know what they look like? And so you get these jokes where, uh, it's a very quick one, um, man goes, um, meets a, a friend of his in... Um, uh, in town, and he says to the man, oh, someone told me you were dead. And the guy says, no, I'm not dead. I mean, look, here I am, you know. Um, and the first man replies, but the person who told me you were dead is much more reliable than you are. And uh, if I was going to push this out, I would go to, you know, to... There's that aspect too about um, w what is it in to know who you are in this world. And that, would, that goes right on to what the 18th century, I suppose. You know, the return of Martin Gare, uh, naturally, Zeman Davis wrote about. Um, you know, who do you, when the guy comes back and says who he is, does he know who he is? Do we know who he is? Um, and what difference does that sense of the question mark over the ego, what difference does that make to this whole range of discourse? Probably quite a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think with this we need to close, although we could keep listening to Mary Beard and her cute intelligence, the way she deconstructs your own questions as you speak and turns it into something else and actually provides a picture of complexity for uh, ancient times that we still have much to learn from and discover possibly uh, if we carry on along her own uh, 
teaching perhaps her own route, uh, which is so honestly fascinating and, and inspiring. Um, so um, we just have to say thank you, Mary Pierre, for being with us. Thank you all for being here, for asking questions, for listening attentively, and I think we're all carrying back home jewels uh, from what we uh, kind of treasure from listening to Mary Beard today. So thank you again. Possibly come again. Thank you. <laughs>